Okay, 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 okay. You know how you can tell a lot about a doctor with dead office plants? You can also tell a lot about a scientific theory by the predictions it makes. Here's the story. In 1972, this handsome fellow made a prediction that at least 90% of DNA appears to represent nonsense. And he coined the term junk DNA. Fast forwarding a bit, in 1980, Nature published papers by influential biologists arguing that evolution predicts our DNA should be full of junk. They predicted junk DNA would be everywhere and that it's folly to hunt for any function in these areas of DNA. Because of natural selection, we should expect to find our bodies riddled with heaps of useless junk DNA. In the early 2000s, the Human Genome Project was finished and we found out that <gasps> Only about 1-2% to 2 of our DNA builds the proteins we need to live. What in the world was the other 98% doing? It was immediately assumed that it was largely junk. This follows a long tradition of evolutionists preferring to view our bodies as poorly cobbled together assemblies of ill-fitted parts held together with not much more than spit and duct tape. You might feel that way the older you get, but that's not because of junk in your DNA. Look at your posture. Eat a vegetable every once in a while for crying out loud. This textbook taught many biology students that over half of the genome is composed of parasite-like segments of DNA and take up large amounts of space. Famed evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins said in 1976, the true purpose of DNA is to survive, no more and no less. The simplest way to explain the surplus DNA is to suppose that it's a parasite. And in 2004, creationists might spend some earnest time speculating on why the creator should bother to litter genomes with untranslated pseudogenes and junk tandem repeat DNA. In 2009, the greater part, 95% in the case of humans, of the genome might as well not be there for all the difference it makes. And Dawkins isn't alone. Prominent evolutionists, from the head of the Faraday Institute to the director of the National Institutes of Health and many tenured professors all predicted junk DNA. And remember, you can tell a lot about a theory from the predictions that it makes. Scientists that supported intelligent design though had different predictions about junk DNA. Ever since the beginning days of the ID movement in the 1990s, ID proponents had predicted that the junk DNA would turn out to be largely functional. What would cause these scientists to go against the tide of decades of established scientific thought? Why does ID predict function for junk DNA? It's simple, because intelligent agents make things with purpose and function. They have reasons for why they do things. Perhaps the earliest ID prediction of a function for junk DNA came in 1994, when pro-ID scientist Forrest Mims submitted a letter to Science warning against assuming that junk DNA was useless. Science would not publish the letter. In 1998, William Dembski predicted function for junk DNA, arguing that even the term junk DNA discouraged scientific inquiry, a label that cloaked scientific ignorance with a veneer of confidence. He says, on an evolutionary view, we expect a lot of useless DNA. If, on the other hand, organisms are designed, we expect DNA, as much as possible, to exhibit function. Design encourages scientists to look for function where evolution discourages it. In 2002, biologist Richard Sternberg published a peer-reviewed paper in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, stating, The selfish DNA narrative and allied frameworks must join the other icons of neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory that, despite their variance with empirical evidence, nevertheless persist in the literature. In other words, the idea of junk DNA was like an idol in the scientific community. Empty, but nevertheless handed down due to tradition rather than evidence. In 2004, biologist Jonathan Wells argued, the fact that junk DNA is not junk has emerged, not because of evolutionary theory, but in spite of it. On the other hand, people asking research questions in an ID framework would presumably have been looking for the functions of non-coding regions of DNA all along, and we might know considerably more about them. In 2011, Wells wrote The Myth of Junk DNA, citing hundreds of peer-reviewed papers finding function for junk DNA. 
In 2012, a game-changing paper was published in Nature from ENCODE, a consortium of hundreds of researchers from all around the world. It found that 80% of DNA shows evidence of functional biochemical activity. Well, so that means 20% is still junk, right? Well, no. Lead ENCODE researcher Ewan Burney noted that they only studied a portion of human cells, and with continued research, it's likely that 80% will go to 100%. The implications were immediately clear. Science Magazine ran a headline stating, ENCODE writes eulogy for junk DNA, and stated that the ENCODE papers sound the death knell for the idea that our DNA is mostly littered with useless bases. Apart from a zealous faction of hardline evolutionists, the consensus of biologists now recognizes that junk DNA isn't junk, but has important functions. In other words, junk DNA was an evolutionary myth. More recent papers confirm this. This 2021 paper declares the days of junk DNA are over. This article in Nature 2021 finds over 130,000 specific functions identified for genomic elements previously called junk DNA. This article says the genome is far from what was once called islands of genes among intergenic deserts. James Shapiro, University of Chicago. The concept of abundant, selfish, or junk DNA in complex genomes is mistaken. This 2023 paper in Bioessays declared a paradigm shift away from the concept of junk DNA. DNA that was previously thought to be junk turns out to have many functions, including forming telomeres, centromeres, and higher order nuclear structures, binding cohesin to chromosomes, nucleation centers for DNA methylation, chromatin condensation, cellular stress responses, cell differentiation, DNA repair, controlling development and forming body plans, controlling the cell cycle, forming fear-related memories and phobia, immune-related functions like fighting virus infections, metabolism-related functions. And the biggest and most important function for junk DNA is that it regulates gene expression. To understand the importance of what this means, consider building a house. Proteins would be like the wood, the bricks, the nails, the concrete. But if you want a house, it's not enough to just have those things laying in a pile. You need to know how to assemble it all. In other words, you need a blueprint. Instructions to tell you how to build the house are just as vital as the physical materials themselves. This is what the non-coding regions of DNA, what we used to call junk DNA, does in your body. It contains the blueprints and tells your body when and where to produce different types of proteins, how much to produce, where to put them, and when to stop making them. In other words, evolutionary biologists for a long time, and many still to this day, discount some of the most important genetic information in your entire body. The story of junk DNA shows that scientists who support intelligent design not only made a prediction that turned out to be true and helped progress science forward, but also evolutionary theory hindered science by discouraging inquiry for years in this very important part of our genome. After ENCODE, most biologists today recognize that junk DNA is highly functional. So how did evolutionists react? There were some intellectual objections to the evidence, but mostly they got angry. They tried to rewrite history, or they tried to deny the data to salvage their beloved theory. But more on that in the next video. Thanks for watching. If you like this kind of science content, please make sure you subscribe so you can be notified when we release future videos.